Hello, hi. Um, I can't see you yet. Yeah, should we begin? <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us um, and uh, just, um, giving out some of your time. Um, you've made a website, uh, badboysofbrexit.com. Um, again, with your own uh, time and with your own um, money. Why did you uh, create this website? What were you uh, hoping people will take away from it? Well, I think for many people, Brexit looks like a rather chaotic process. And it's turning into something of a soap opera, you know, and the, the media are treating it in terms of these sort of big characters, you know, Boris with his jokes and David Davis, the Brexit bulldog, and, you know, poor old Theresa May, the victim in the middle of it all. But actually behind the scenes, there's really important shifts of power going on. And the, the point of the website was to ask people, you know, suggest that they look behind the kind of soap opera of Brexit and think about how power is really shifting in our country. And so we, we looked at who actually funded Brexit and what they had to gain from it. And, you know, I hope people will have a look at that and will consider that because this is the biggest change that's happened in our country in my lifetime. And there are some people who are driving a process that's really against the interests of most of us. And I think I, I've come around very firmly to the view that they should be stopped. And I think that people looking at this website are very likely to agree with me. And, I mean, there are plenty of people uh, that I hadn't heard of at all, um, along with, of course, um, people that everyone is going to recognise, people like um, Alexander Nix and uh, Richard Tice. No clue yeah, um, at all. No, sure. um, so I suppose... What's quite disturbing yeah. is the connections between them, right, once yeah. you start looking. You see, it's actually a very small kind of tight-knit bunch of people who've been working together on things for years, some of them, you know, to, to come to this point of taking us out of the European Union. And they want to do that for their own reasons, not for the good of the country or for the good of people like us. Sure. Um, and indeed, as well as being interconnected themselves, they've, you've, so you've categorised them into money men, regulation burners, Russia connection, um, but plenty of them do overlap as well. Sure. Um, so... And as you said, I mean, all of them had deep vested interests in Brexit taking place. Um, I suppose in the case of Boris, he would have been trying to appear as if he wanted Brexit to take place, um, but would nevertheless have benefited from it. And, um, yeah, well, for some people it was just about their career. Yeah, yeah. But people had other motivations. Um, so, I mean, if we begin with the sort of shadiest group, the one that I recognise these people from, um, the Money Men. Uh, yeah. Who are they? What and and how do they? Um, if you can put it into general terms, how would they benefit financially? Well, from... I, I think we've got two groups of people. Yeah. Here. We've got the, the hedge fund people and the tax avoidance people. Mm -hmm. so, so, to understand why hedge funds will be interested in Brexit, you've got to to understand how they work. And basically, a hedge fund is a gambling organisation that makes money through taking positions, as they would call it, but sort of laying a bet against various things happening. And if you place a bet against something happening, which is really unlikely to happen, and then it happens, that's when you really hit the jackpot. So, for example, Chris Binodi, who's on the website, he made £200 million on the night of the Brexit vote because of the fall in the pound. So he betted that the bet that the pound would fall. When that happens, he then makes £200 million. Um, a lot of hedge funds are now taking bets against a hard Brexit, because if a hard Brexit happens again, the, the pound will collapse further. So effectively, they're betting on the collapse of the British economy. And what's particularly infuriating about these people is that they portray Brexit as an exercise in democracy, but actually they are seeking to profit from the damage of, to the British economy that Brexit is causing. And I find that utterly despicable. So there's them. But then there's also a bunch of people who already made a lot of money and then they, they want to have control of that money and they don't want to have to share it with anybody and they don't want to pay a decent level of taxes. So they're very upset about the sort of work I'm doing in the European Parliament to make sure that there's much less opportunity for money laundering and tax avoidance. And the EU's made some significant advances in that direction. So the sort of secret financial flows that used to go on um, are being curtailed and money is being monitored much more closely. And so a whole bunch of people are, are very unhappy with that. And you can see a link between people who are engaged in offshore activities like Jacob rees mogg for example, who has Somerset Asset Management based offshore um, and 
you know, also incidentally started out working with Chris Binodi. Um, and, you know, he's the sort of person who makes all sorts of um, ideological, patriotic arguments for Brexit, but basically it's about um, making sure that he doesn't have to pay taxes and pay his fair share for, for society. Yeah, and even perhaps, um, although, so it's still affecting to be ideologically driven. We have regulation burners um, yeah. who would be um, promising to cut red tape, um, but would uh, still be benefiting hugely from uh, less regulation uh, on their own companies and interests. Um, if people like uh, Liam Fox was the one that sprang to my mind. Um, yeah. Tell us well, more. It's, it's, it's quite interesting what's happening in Liam Fox's department because there was a leak over the weekend which showed that you know a bunch of very right wing US think tanks and pressure groups are working with um, pressure groups in this country to lobby the government to cut regulation after Brexit. And today we have David Davis coming out and saying it's not going to be this Mad Max scenario. No. There are a long way out behind the wonderful promises of Brexit to say don't worry, it won't be as bad as Mad Max. But, but basically, this is, a, this is an age-old political disagreement that goes back to the early days of Thatcherism, which is about how much should political democratic forces, you know, the state, the government, be allowed to constrain what individuals can get up to. And interestingly, since the referendum result came in, we've spoken to a lot of businesses, and they don't want to change European regulation. This pressure is not coming from businesses. They're happy with the sort of standards and rules that the European Union um, ha has agreed politically and is now enforcing. It's much more driven by people who are just ideologically for a small state, for shrinking the state, you know, the sort of far-right Austrian-style economists, people like Daniel Hannan himself, who's always argued that the state should sort of butt out and let the free market get on with it. Europe's very much opposed to that. The, the point of the European Union is to constrain the way capitalism functions, to prevent it from operating against the interests of ordinary citizens, to protect the environment, to protect our rights at work. You can see those protections at risk from the bunch of people that we've identified on the website. Mm -hmm. um, and if, there are, of course, just people who are playing ideologues um, when it comes to um, perhaps most of all the people connected with Russia, um, people like Steve Bannon, who w perhaps would not only have hoped that um, you know, desperately that Brexit would take place, but also that it would in some way precipitate the collapse of the European project um, yeah. as a whole. Um, so tell me more about, I mean, we've got people under the Russia connection like Aaron Banks, um, Boris Johnson himself, indeed. Um, in what way was he implicated? Um, and of course, this is on the website, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting, I think, the, the Russian angle. Um, because... Some of the people who argued for Brexit genuinely saw problems, unsurmountable problems with the European Union, but a lot of them were actually seeking to destroy the European Union. The question for some was, is Britain off, better off outside? But for others, the whole objective was to destroy the European Union as a kind of bastion of strong regulation and strong democracy. And we've seen a lot of attacks on the European Union from authoritarian regimes. And as you say, Russia is key there. But now you see connections with very far right groups in the US, such as Breitbart and Steve Bannon and so on. And their objective is the same. It's to diminish the quality and strength of our democracies. They, they do that for different reasons, but, you know, you start to see the Eurosceptic forces now as a sort of global movement to challenge the democratic standards that we've enjoyed since the Second World War and basically to move back to an era of nationalism and authoritarian regimes, which was what caused the Second World War. So I, I see Europe very much as representing peace and democracy. Of course, it's got its problems. Of course, there's things we need to improve. But you can see from the people, the enemies of Europe, exactly what it is they fear and exactly the kind of world that they would be offering us. And just in terms of Russia itself, we don't actually know very much about what these connections are, because unlike in the US, where the FBI have conducted a public investigation into this and have now indicted 13 Russians for manipulating the presidential campaign, in Europe, there's been there has been activity and investigation, but mostly it's been conducted by the security services in secret, and they haven't told us what they found. So there's been some analysis of um, trolls and bots working out of St. Petersburg, which has been conducted 
based on what you can see from their traffic and where they're actually registered and what kind of scripts they use and so on. But in terms of the fundamental information about Russian involvement in Brexit, we're still waiting to hear. You know, there's a couple of inquiries, one by the Electoral Commission and one by the Culture, Media and Sport Committee. But effectively, they've been to the social media companies and said, you know, what did Russia infiltrate you? Were there Russian bots influencing what happened during the referendum campaign? And they have, those organisations, Twitter and Facebook, are refusing to release the information. So, we're in quite a, a space of not knowing here, but you know, as as you said on the website, there's quite a lot of work being done by Carol Cadwallader at the Guardian, which we've relied on strongly to just show the relationships between, for example, the Russian ambassador Yakovenko yeah, and people leading the Leave campaign. So there's some very, st I mean, there's more than circumstantial evidence. There are some strong relationships there, but I don't feel we've got anywhere near the bottom. Sure. Quite surprising that there hasn't been more interest from. Um, the police from public bodies and also from journalists. Do you think among those, do the um, Electoral Commission need to catch up in some way on what happens online, especially well, with... The, the Electoral yeah. Commission are conducting an investigation, but, but it's taking them an awfully long time, considering, you know, this was six months before the, the yeah, presidential yeah. campaign. And first of all, they basically tried to draw a veil over all of this. It's embarrassing. It's quite frightening to think that your democracy is under attack by a foreign power and to think that the Russians may have infiltrated really to the heart of our government. But, you know, we need brave people to come forward and do that. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're in touch with the Electoral Commission. We're encouraging them and we're asking them, do you have the resources you need? Because I have to say, compared to the FBI, you know, they're a very small yes. bit without many powers. And I, I mean, the main question I keep asking is, who has the power to do this? You know, why aren't we seeing serious and organised crime office of the police or, you know, the, we're, we're actively engaged in trying to encourage people to investigate this more fully. So to, to wrap up, basically, um, the organisation I'm part of, Vault, uh, um, attempting to kind of galvanise um, support for the European Union. Um, do you have um, a message or, um, or anything you hope for in the future in terms of uh, how Europeans can unify in the face of Brexit and in the face of uh, Russian subversion in all kinds of elections. Um, what can be done? What can young people do, basically? Um, I think, <coughs> you know, Wise Up is one thing. I'm sure um, young people will enjoy the website. We've tried to make it quite lively and entertaining. I think share with your friends what we found out about who's really driving Brexit. I mean, young people weren't fooled by the arguments like older people were. You know, they don't have that kind of nostalgia. They're looking to the future. They, they know largely what they're going to be losing. But I think to, to be informed about the murky forces that drove Brexit really helps galvanise people to try to stop it. And I think we need young people particularly to mobilise and to come forward and say, look, what we know now is so much more than what we knew during the referendum campaign. And that's why, not only in terms of what the deal is likely to be, but also in terms of the forces behind Brexit. And I think this is why we have an absolute right to say, when it's clear what the deal means, and what Brexit really means, as opposed to those promises, we have an absolute democratic right to say we want a final say. And, <clears throat> you know, I'd like to encourage young people to campaign for that. We can still stop Brexit. You're going to be living most of your lives in the regime that these people are cooking up for you. So, you know, please do what you can. Get on board, mobilise. We can we can get out in the streets, demand that second referendum, yeah, yeah. campaign to stay and win a, a referendum to stay in the European Union. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.